say, for example, in the Justice for Johnny Depp community, if you get a fact wrong, you have people ready to jump on you to be like, no, you are wrong about that. <laughs> and we will call you out for it. It makes you better at what at your craft. It makes you better at at making sure that you have all of your your eyes dotted and your T's crossed in the same way us lawyers we also have the possibility of other lawyers jumping on us and being like, yeah. you're wrong. <laughs> there are people out there that believe that law tubers, quote unquote, are yeah. not real lawyers. So yeah. which area of law do you specialize in? <laughs> <laughs> well, I can I can start by saying I am actively licensed in both California and Washington, D.C., uh, so I am I am actually a licensed attorney. I'm I'm up on all of my bar fees, <laughs> um, uh, and uh, and uh, in good standing, I should say. Um, my background is primarily in litigation, some transactional work as well. But I've done uh, employment litigation, business litigation, and uh, wills, trusts, estates, conservatorships, that kind of stuff. Um, so that's, that's really where most of my personal background comes in is, is civil litigation. Um, so we saw from the beginning that the internet was overwhelmingly pro Johnny Depp, um, memes and videos and things that defended Johnny and bashed Amber Heard often very misogynistically. Did you start your YouTube channel just to spite Amber Heard? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, 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 no. I started. So I guess I, I, I don't know how much detail you're looking for in, in terms of my my back, my backstory for how I started my channel. But um, I never had any designs of, of starting a YouTube channel. Um, in fact, I had a, a couple uh, people that I worked with over the years who had kind of casually tossed out like you should start a youtube channel because of the way that you explain things and i was like you're crazy there's yeah. no way there's no way i would ever do that my hand was kind of in a sense forced um at during the the pandemic actually it was my husband who came up with the idea for me to start a youtube channel because he had overheard me explaining legal concepts to people over the phone at that point from from working remotely from home and um and so, yeah, he came up with the idea and that basically sort of sprung from there. And I, I loved the idea of of being in a position to share my knowledge, my experience, my expertise with people basically for free um, because it's there's such a high barrier for most people to get access to that kind of information. Lawyers are so expensive. Representation is so expensive. Um, and so, you know, the more people can learn about this stuff for free, the better. <laughs> so it wasn't despite Amber Heard then. All right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Had absolutely nothing to do with Amber Heard. <laughs> Why do you think this case was so impactful um, in regards to um, in regards to the culture at large? And yeah, like why was this case so? I'm not gonna say polarizing. I think that is that has an element to it, but it was really captivating. Why do you think that is? I think I think that part of it is because you know there there is the Hollywood celebrity aspect of course that yeah. I think is part of it because having a having a celebrity lawsuit is one thing those happen all the time but having a case actually go to trial is another and then on top of that having cameras in the courtroom yeah. people are going to be very curious about that so there is that element but then there's also kind of touching on on my answer to the last question which is seeing a different story that's behind the story that you've been told right it's like it's like finding out the secret history of history um and i think that everyone has a certain curiosity if they feel like they may have been either lied to or misled by by a person or by a group of people they always are going to be much more curious to look under the hood to see what the truth really is um and i think that also in combination with the massive scale of the Me Too movement. And I think a lot of people kind of starting to see how the pendulum swung very much from one side to another, which where it started was arguably not where it needed to be. But then when it swung all the way over to this side, to the far end, the far end was probably about where Amber Heard came out with her with her allegations. <laughs> 
you know, I think a lot of people were seeing that and and saying like, well, hold on. I think I think now we maybe need to have a conversation about how far this should go or should have gone and, you know, where this pendulum really should be anyway. So there was also that sort of cultural conversation that I think a lot of people were having, regardless of whether they were they were domestic violence or or sexual assault survivors or IPV survivors, you know, or people who had been accused or loved ones of those who had been accused. I got so many messages from mothers of sons who had been, from what they were saying, wrongfully accused by their partners or former partners just to try to like gain some kind of an advantage against them during their separation. So yeah. I, I, there were, there were just, there were so many elements there that so many people found was very important to them in this trial and seeing, seeing that justice play out yeah. <clears throat> in real time was very important to a lot of people. There was a lot of media attention in regards to the verdict and the outcome of this case and the most common theme or the, the, the topic that, that was talked about is how this would impact uh survivors what legal impacts um does this have because the reason why i'm asking it like this is because one side they were saying they were um, it would impact people that would that would talk about the case but also they also said at the same time that it would impact um those that want to report to the police and all those things and that's where i'm like okay let's ask a lawyer let's <laughs> see what legal implications can come from this defamation case you know there's there are multiple ways of kind of looking at it in terms of like the the law like how how does this case impact case law well it, it is in the trial court so when you when you talk about precedent the trial court level doesn't have any uh, any precedential value on future cases. It's when you start getting to the appellate level or the Supreme Court level that you then have case law that the lower courts have to follow um, in in making their determinations. So in terms of like like whether or not this means that future cases would be adjudicated in a certain way, not really. <laughs> um, in terms of, you know, people coming forward with their claims of IPV, DV, SA, um, all the alphabet soup, um, you know, that that is, that is, it comes down to, sorry, <laughs> it comes down to like how, sorry, like how, I know, it's every time I, I, I go through all of them, I'm like, I'm going through all the letters in the alphabet. <laughs> all right. Every time it comes down to, yeah, sorry about that. I, it, it, that's okay. It comes down to the perception of these people, right? And and how they personally perceive whether or not this was good or bad for for um, these survivors of, of these incidents. We have so many people in the community of, of people that support Johnny Depp who, in fact, are themselves survivors of exactly all of these things and so for them they say i am emboldened to talk about what happened to me because that was johnny depp he he is in the position of of the survivor amber heard is not really a survivor johnny depp is and so his case means that people will actually listen to someone particularly for a lot of men who found themselves in that position and found themselves uh not heard not listened to and and much more likely to be mocked because there are all kinds of like extra cultural you know um cultural ideas about the role of men and masculinity and these kinds of things that it's like it can seem almost unbelievable that a man could be to a lot of people that a man could be um abused in that way i i i i I think that it's 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 very it's very interesting to see the perception kind of shift on on what is possible and how things how people can be surprised by what can happen behind closed doors in a in a, in a close personal intimate relationship. Mm. Um, so you know, with with the idea that that people are are less likely to come forward. That is always a possibility, but that really depends on the perception for each individual. And I think that for those people, it really doesn't do any good 
for people to come out with the articles that they did saying this makes it harder for these people because they are sending that message to the people that are not so initiated with what happened in this case with with what with what happened you know how how the facts came out with this trial mm. that they may just hear that message and say oh that's what that means i'm not going to come forward yeah. i'm afraid but the ones who did pay attention and did watch i had people come uh you know write me messages talking about how they had a a court hearing or a court case coming up where they had to be a witness in their own case and they were emboldened by watching how how things played out for Johnny Depp and also understanding the process by watching a panel of lawyers describe what was happening so that they could be less intimidated to go into that process and and actually live through through that experience which was i mean when i heard that from that person i was like that is everything you just said um something that was really that was really poignant there and that was the panel of lawyers that you assembled but this is something that i praise you for and quite a, quite a lot of people even the amber her supporters that 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 i've spoken to that gave their opinions on law tube they have actually watched your channel and they have actually been been impressed with this aspect as well what was the thought what was the thought process that inspired you to bring other individuals such as therapists such as um uh body language analysis all of those uh -huh. like because that's so out Mercy. there that that is so it, it, yeah. i mean sorry sorry for geeking but that is <laughs> that is what made me switch over because i watched i started from law and crime and i was watching mm -hmm. that and then yours came suggested so uh -huh. i switched over and i i saw the commentary and then it was really diverse so yeah so like what really what caused what was the thinking behind that well i i i knew that my so i never want to be talking out of my ass <laughs> <laughs> is is one thing but i also wanted to be able to get that information partly for myself, but also for the viewers. You know, like I said, I, 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 I wanted to take the viewers along this journey with me so that I could understand while they are understanding, you know, as, as we're kind of going through this together. And I knew that I am not qualified to talk about medicine. I am not qualified to talk about psychology, although sometimes I like to be a little bit of an armchair psychologist, just like most people, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but like, but um, I, I knew that that I I wanted to make sure that the 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 commentary that I was giving was truly based off of what I can professionally say as an attorney. Mm -hmm. And so when I saw the first one that I that I saw was was in I mean I, I actually maybe the first person was was Spidey at behavioral arts, the mm. the um uh the behavioral analyst. Yeah. Um, he may have been the first one that I that I thought of to 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 have to bring on because body language would be very interesting throughout the trial. Yeah. Um, but then I saw Nurse Liz pop up in the chat, and and so uh, so my my um, my editor who was kind of behind the scenes with me, he noticed also, and so we 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 looked in and we're like, oh, Nurse Liz, let's let's check her out, you know, like kind of quickly silently on the side. Um, and then I was like, oh, this looks like a good person to bring on. So I, I found her email and just emailed her and was like, do you want to come on and, and join and, <laughs> yeah. and, you know, talk about stuff? Because she was already kind of explaining in the chat. And I was like, this would be a perfect person to, to bring on and give her expertise. Like, like, I want this for everyone. Like, I want to <laughs> I want to I want it for me and I want it for everyone else, too. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so so that was just like it kind of just became this this natural thing, which was, OK, there's a new area of expertise. Who can we who can we get in to like pick someone's brain so that so that we can get get information from them, get their take on things, because that might be different from what I'm seeing yeah. as as a, a layman in those those fields. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I, 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 I completely understand. I, I forgot the name of this other person. Um, forgive me for that. Well, if she's watching, forgive me. Um, but I think she is a BPD. Um, uh, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna say sufferer, but so can I say survivor? I, I don't, I don't, I don't know what word to use yeah. here. But she, she, she has, she has BPD. I guess you could, you could say. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I think she was giving. I think 
when she was giving her testimony and uh, sorry, not when, no, not, not testimony. Sorry, when Amber was giving her testimony and then the BPD di- di- diagnosis come up, and she was really on hand to address everything. Information. How did you control so that there was no that your viewers were not really misinformed let me ask that one first uh, like how, uh, like, yeah. like how did you what what was the co- the quality control like uh, like and the flow of information yeah well i mean most of the most of the lawyers that were on the panel i had already been working with for quite a while and so i knew i knew their style i knew their the way that we would talk about cases on on other live streams and stuff over the previous year i guess um, and so, you know, we had kind of already had this this history of being able to talk about these these cases together. And so understanding how we would kind of someone would put out a thought, someone else would would play devil's advocate. Like we already knew that there was this sort of like like push and pull that we that we would do in mm-hmm. a lot of these conversations. And and not always. I mean, sometimes everyone would agree. And yeah. and that's that's when people would really get very like skeptical of like, oh, like, are you colluding with something? No, we just happen to agree on this one. <laughs> um, I mean, is it is it such a coincidence that when a topic of credibility came up, everybody agreed? Like, <laughs> like that, that can't happen. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, yeah, continue. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, so, so there was, it basically was just sort of that. I mean, other than that, I, I really didn't have very much control at all other than like, you know, I, I, I would, I, every day there would be a new, a new stream yard link to be sent out to people. So I guess I, I could have decided to say like, I'm not giving out the stream yard link to certain, you know, individuals moving forward, but you know, throughout the trial, I, I was, you know, maybe even a little bit loosey goosey on that and just sort of like sending it out to basically everyone that that I was like, you know, if you're interested, come come and join. Um, The reporting of this case from like, you know, in terms of what you earn and yeah, (laughs) let's talk about it. What was it like seeing that unveiled, which led to a mass deletion by someone I'm not going to (laughs) name? Um, she who must not be named. Uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, if you, if you actually say her name, she will she will actually magically appear and then like cast a spell. No, um, three times. Uh, you gotta say it three times. Then it happen. Yeah, 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 exactly. Uh, so so I I you know it, that's another aspect of YouTube, but the way in which it's weaponized to make it look like that is 100% what these people are, are doing it for is just for the clicks. They're modifying their their take or their argument or the way that they see things just for the money is, is I think it, it's, it's sad. It's sad because that is the, the particular way in which that person clearly views the world themselves and probably what they would do themselves to, to modify their argument for money. I mean- um, it's projection, yeah. basically. Is, no, is no, the way I, 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 I understand where you're coming from. I, I mean, that was going to be my my next question. Where I was going to be like, like, how does this actually impact the way that we present information? Like, does let me put it like this: you know that you have to get views to yeah. make money. You know that you that you also get super chats because people appreciate your work. Is it a situation in which you would become more salacious? Don't get it twisted. Don't get it twisted. I've seen lawyers on YouTube. I'm not going to name them at all, (laughs) but I've seen them kind of thread that line a little bit and go beyond the level, like, you know, sometimes even get some things that are verifiably wrong. And, you know, like... How have you controlled for that, if that makes sense, uh, if I'm if I'm even yeah. asking it properly? I, I you know, uh, dollars can definitely lead people astray, you know, yeah. anyone, including including lawyers. We're all human. Right. Um, for me personally, I, I think in terms of the salaciousness, I don't think that I can really pull off salacious (laughs) personally i am i am i am a little bit too my personality is just a little bit too basic and milk toast to really pull that off personally yeah i don't i don't know that that i 
I can be salacious because even even when it comes to like, you know, I also understand that when you put out a video, you've got to have a thumbnail and a, and a title for that thumbnail that is going to, you know, generate some attention so that people will actually click on it and watch your content. So like, I, I understand that, but that's probably the, the thing that I have always struggled with so much because it, it's not in my personality to be like out there and, and, you know, edgy and, and all that kind of stuff. So it's like sometimes that the edgier, the edgier titles can, can be the ones that are, that are the most attention grabbing and actually get the click. And so, you know, so I've, I've had to kind of like teach myself to be a little bit more bold with like the way that I, I put the thumbnail and the title out there. Um, but you know, in terms of it, like, you know, changing my analysis or changing how, how I view things. I, I, I think that at the end of the day, it still comes down to, like I said, that, that fear that I have that I'll be called out by my, by my profession, you know, for, for selling out and for, for being, you know, uh, I don't know, basically sell, selling out my brain, you know? Yeah, yeah. One of the that that was actually kind of one of the reasons why it was so important to me that um, Dr. Courtney Tracy, by the way, was was her name. Ah, okay. um, <laughs> so for the, yeah. the the truth doctor is, the is truth, her. Yeah, her YouTube that's, name. It. Yeah. that's it. Yeah. So yeah. that was one of the reasons why it was so important to me that I I managed to get her onto my channel because um, having someone who has uh, who has BPD. Um, and who also is somebody who is in a position to diagnose and talk about these kinds of things from a from a clinical standard. Yeah. Um, it it reminded it kind of allowed me not to get ahead of myself in terms of like talking about Amber having BPD. And it also helped to kind of like refocus the chat also on that particular mm. sort of diagnosis, because, yeah. Yeah. you know, viewers can also get get you know, carried away, all of us can get carried away with, with, you know, carrying a particular flag. Yeah. But when you see someone, someone else who's not part of this case, he's who, who is not part of, of, you know, any of the witnesses or anything, but is on the side who is able to come and talk to us kind of tangentially on the topic, it kind of like gives, gives a little bit of like cold water on the side to, to, to show like, these are human beings. We, we also need to remember that we need to have some empathy here too for, for the different sides. And it kind of helps to sort of like dial down some of the emotions that we can definitely get carried away with in a case like this. No, I completely understand that. I completely, which is where, and I'm glad you brought that back up because I, I was, this is where the value comes in that does bring monetary uh rewards this was a case that was decided based on the evidence and based on credibility issues from what i've yes. observed yes and there there was one um one um there there was one uh correlate correlating factor that that both nurse Liz and courtney had that i've noticed and it was how they did not like how the ther- the clinical psychologists, you know, both um both uh Dr. Hughes and Dr. Curry, how mm-hmm. they were presenting the information they were presenting. And that is something I gotta ask to get a more understanding of how it works legally in the in the US. Clinical psych uh sorry for for forensic psych- psychologists or those experts, how is it control? How is bias controlled? Because when when you're getting paid to yeah. to you know like it, 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 it can it can present ethical issues like you know, um. So how how does the system control for that? I should ask. Cross examination. Okay. That's that's the first that's the first way. Uh, I think that one of the things that that was very interesting that sort of like really bubbled up in my conversations with Dr. Dr. Tracy and with Dr. Kirk Honda, who also came on the on the yeah, channel too. I love him. I he love also him. I love him. he yeah. also had his opinions about about both of the 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 psycho psychologist experts. Um, 
is that their their role, like the role of Dr. Honda and of Dr. Tracy, is very different than the role of a of a psychologist that is as an expert because, you know, the idea of of like truth um, with my conversations with Dr. Honda was very it was so interesting because for me as a litigator, it's like there is one truth, capital T, that is it. That's what we're trying to get to the bottom of here is, you know, through the adversarial process, you know, like that's what we end up like, you know, coming out of this this dust storm with <laughs> is like the truth. And so for him, you can have relative truth, like because for him, his role as a uh, as a psychologist, as a therapist is to take someone to come to walk in through the door, sit down on a chair in front of him, talk about their experiences and to just be there with them. For him, like whether truth exists with, with a capital T is much less of an issue for them, for him. Like, it's like, he doesn't even really think about that at all. But for me, so like, so, to, so for him to say, you know, speaking your truth, speaking my truth is something that is a absolutely has zero problem for him. But for me as a, as a litigator, I'm like, mm, no, there's one, there's one, there's only one. <laughs> we're going to, we're going to find it, <laughs> you know, but I, I was able to like, understand like, okay, so there is, there is a place in this world for there to be a my truth and your truth and all this and that exists in in the realm of of you know being in a therapist's office so you have to like think of it as like they have different purposes and and yes a a an expert witness is getting paid all expert witnesses practically i i, I all of them that i know of are getting paid for their time and, and their their expertise and everything same thing is true of the lawyers. Same thing yeah. is true of the judge. Same thing, you know, like everyone who's there as a professional in that courtroom is getting paid for their time and for their expertise and their experience. Um, and the same is true for for a therapist, but it's just that the goals are are different. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's interesting that your question is following up right after the Taylor Lorenz question about like, you know, us being paid for our, <laughs> you know, like what we're doing. It's it's. It's similar in some respects in that, like, yes, we are getting paid by people who are appreciating the things that we are saying. Um, but, you know, I guess just as a as a reminder, when you have so many voices on a panel on your channel, um, you can't you cannot possibly control for what they are saying. Yeah. They are going to say and that's the whole point in having so many people on there is to get so many different takes. Yeah. And so I loved that, especially at the beginning, we had basically everyone on the panel was like, nope, he's he's going to lose. <laughs> I mean, good luck, Johnny Depp, but yeah. I mean, <laughs> what's the likelihood of him winning here? You know, and seeing their opinions change over time was was such a beautiful thing because, number one, showing that it is it is permissible and, in fact, encouraged for someone to change their opinion as they learn more information. Um, I think a lot of people sometimes forget that 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 mm. is something that they're allowed to do. Yeah. And so people get entrenched in their ideas, regardless of what facts come across their way. Yeah. Um, but so, you know, that and then also to show like what what they needed to see in order for those changes to happen was was very, very valuable, I think. Are you are you a proponent or an advocate for cameras in the courtroom? Um. I think for the most part, yes. I think that having having more more access to courtrooms is generally better so that people can can see how the justice system is working, um, either to educate them on the justice system or to make sure that there are people that are watching and making sure that things are 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 happening the way that they should be. Um, I do understand that there are <sighs> When it comes to cases involving DV and IPV and SA that are incredibly sensitive, it's it's it adds a certain layer of sensitivity um, that having mass cameras in the courtroom can be very very difficult for a lot of people to grasp. And I think that you know where you have, although, but at the sa at the same time litigation in general is is a process of opening up your guts for a lot of people to see um even if it's not even if it's not you know involving like sa or any of these other elements that were that were in like this case for example it just ha i i have had you know clients before who who didn't want to hand over their their tax documents to the other side 
but they had to because they were they were alleging that they had been economically harmed by the conduct of of the defendant so if you are going to allege something like that the other side has the right to to question that and to to question whether or not the evidence shows that that that's actually been true um so the litigation process as a whole is an incredibly uncomfortable process for anyone the other side gets access to so much of your life that that normally no one would have any right to to get into but because you've made a legal issue of it or the other side has made made a legal issue of it then all of a sudden everyone is able to exchange this information um so you know of course when that the more that gets to a public forum like an open courtroom where people regardless of whether there are cameras in the courtroom you've got people the public can come in and, and sit in on it you know like people can come in writers you know can journalists can come in sit in on a trial and then report on it afterwards um so this information can get out there um but i un- i also understand the pause that a lot of people have about a case involving sa and having cameras in the courtroom for that kind of that kind of a matter um a case like this where arguably the matter has has been put quite public by the defendant already i think it's a little bit different um you know where where it was amber heard talking about how she had been had been essayed you know in that in original op-ed you know she kind of she she references it right um she has already arguably made that into a a public a very public uh ordeal which is i think different than than most most cases of of sa where you know somebody goes to the police and reports a crime it's a little bit different than broadcasting in a massive op-ed in the washington post can it be a legal error legal error to allow cameras in a courtroom like like an appealable error like for example no i don't I, well i don't know <laughs> i mean it's it's it, it is one of those discretionary decisions that so long as the judge has a decent reason for it yeah. uh that's that's a that's a that's a good enough reason for it to be upheld generally speaking um but i i i also you know like i said earlier the the first amendment in the united states is a very 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 strong a uh, strong reason for anything and that's that's there's a strong first amendment right um that the public has in our judicial system to make sure that it is functioning properly because it let's face i mean the the, the courthouse the courtroom is is the government it's a government proceeding um so we need to we need to to you know have a certain level of access to the courtroom to make sure that that things are working the way that they yeah. that they should be yeah on um complete understand so do you think that it do you think it changed the verdict in any way like uh did these jurors went online on social media and look up the uk transcripts look up um you know and compare and contrast on you know what's going on here like yeah you know, is that... <laughs> i mean the jury is made up of human beings right so yeah. and and human beings are absolutely fallible can totally you know fail and make mistakes and do the wrong thing at any point in time but you know at the same time we have to have a certain level of trust in our judicial system in order for it to function so the default rule always is the jury is doing something doing what they are supposed to do unless we find evidence otherwise so you 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 kind of you have to trust that that's what's happening um and and you know i do think that when it comes to the jury when it comes to the whole the whole process that that a that a juror goes through in order to become a member of the jury generally speaking nobody wants to be on that jury so people are going to try to get out as as much as they possibly can unless you have some kind of an activist juror that happens unfortunately but like generally that speaking boy. <laughs> that boy trying to get... i must be in that room <laughs> It could be. It could. It could be. Right. It could be. Um, you know, the 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 Ghislaine Maxwell trial, I think, was was one where 
there was a juror who who gave an interview afterwards and he definitely sounded like he had he had you know tried to make his way onto that jury but the 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 standard for getting a verdict overturned for something like that is like they have to have truly uh like lied to get their way in there and and provably so so it's like there it didn't overturn the verdict because he didn't lie to get his way onto the jury it was just it could i i think it if i remember correctly the two sides the attorneys on on both sides like they someone didn't quite do their full due diligence (laughs) to make sure that certain things were done yeah. yeah yeah so so it's it's you know, it's these kinds of things that that lawyers worry about, right? That that are making mistakes can be can be very very Damaging. you know costly yeah. for for one side or another. Yeah. But you know, but like I said, you know, we have to we have to we have to trust that what they are what they are what the jurors are are doing is the is the right thing. And psychologically speaking, I think you know from from what I've observed and what I've learned over over the years is that. Somebody doesn't want to be on the jury, but once they find themselves locked in and in, in, in that in that jury seat, and especially as the case moves forward, they start to really get a very strong impression of like, I have a very big responsibility here that I have to take seriously because this is someone's life. Yeah. that is in in my hands yeah. most people i think feel that responsibility and want to do their job in the right way and no i completely uh, i completely understand that um the reason why i ask is just purely because of you know they were talking about there's been talks of jury sequestration 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 equestrian who knows <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, that there's been Dirt on horses somewhere. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, like, could this case have been sequestered? Like, what? How? How does how how does that process work? Well, so sequestration it takes a lot of resources. It 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 really 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 does. Um, because the the costs to to the state go way up because now you've got you've got people you need to have. Um, you know, a place for them to stay. You need to have people to to watch over them to make sure that nobody gets to them and to make sure that they don't sneak out. <laughs> you also the 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 payment for them, I believe, also goes up quite a bit because more of their lives are being held up by by this trial. Um, and and it's just so just on the 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 resources side of like how much this trial actually costs the state to have um just goes way way up at the same time it can also have a psychological impact on the jury as well um that by the time they get to the 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 jury room after everything's said and done they just want to be out of there and so they may not take their 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 due time their due diligence in actually reaching a verdict and just saying like let's just do what seems like the easiest thing to do from here um so it's it's it can have its its own like negative um its own negative impacts on the ultimate outcome of of the trial so so sequestration is it's one of those things that that courts really try to not take lightly uh for for a multitude of reasons okay so okay um who decides whether the the jury gets to, like who 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 decides that is it the judge or the parties like uh who like what's the process there like the parties can ask for it, but ultimately, it's it's up to the judge. So, so, okay. So, based on that, even let let's say that the parties don't request for it, right? They don't request at all. Can the judge still um, go go ahead and se- and sequester them? You know, that's an interesting question. I don't actually know the answer to that question. I think I think that if if one side says that that it did in fact have an impact on the outcome i think that they they could appeal it the question is whether or not that would be a winning a winning argument and and anytime it's a decision that is discretionary that's up to the judge they're gonna have a very high burden in Uh, in overcoming that 
because mm -hmm. because uh, discretionary decisions by the judge are given a lot of latitude. I mean, really, like I said, they, they just have to have some kind of reason that on on as a baseline kind of checks out like, oh, OK, that that sounds like like a legitimate reason. Case is done. The case is settled. Um, I have to be careful with that word now because for some reason, I'm a, you know, settle means, I don't know, I don't know. Work us, walk <laughs> us through settlements. They come together and they say, all right, this is how much it is worth it to me to to walk away. Um, so a lot of times people will will take settlement as um, as like, you know, one side winning versus the other, you know, but it really is very much a mathematical equation that both sides have done, which is which is to say that not just like financial, but also emotional health wise, because these this process can be so taxing on someone's physical health, their emotional health, their relationships with their family members, like like the litigation process can really gut a person. Um, so so, you know, all of these things sort of factor into how how much like what is the number that someone is willing to walk away from this dispute and and agree not to refile or agree not to you know continue on with it for the settlement that happened out of the appeals you know that was the dispute there people have to understand like what was it that was being settled there was a second dispute the dispute was you know what these various legal questions were in the appellate court, which were not the same factual questions that were in the trial court. It, those were all questions of law in the appellate court talking about, you know, Amber Heard had some, you know, had some arguments about, about you know, various things, right? Both sides did. Um, but those were those were ultimately the, the the legal issues that had yet to be determined. And so both sides had to had to decide, OK, the questions that we are putting forward right now in front of this court, how much is it worth it to me to 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 put my knives down and walk away? Like, what would it take for for me to do that? And then that ultimately is what the settlement is there for. OK, so basically this settlement doesn't in any way upset what happened at trial court that, like, you know, I, I, no, no, no. If 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 anything, so so what if anything? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, so the so the the appellate questions were there. There are new questions, some of which could undermine the verdict. Others could could undermine you know the the process, and then you know have to like restart everything from the beginning. Um, but uh, ultimately, the appeal the appeal determination would have potentially modified the verdict because they would have had to go back and, and potentially retry various aspects um, of the of, of the trial court, whether it was Johnny Depp winning, you know, and talking about Adam Waldman's statements, whether or not those can be applied to Johnny Depp, you know, whether whether an attorney's like those are some actually very interesting legal questions that were asked there. Um, and so so the 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 appellate questions if they had actually gone to like full determination at the appellate level could have modified the verdict but at this point there was just this sort of like purgatory that those questions were in that they had not yet you know modified that verdict so it kind of like wipes that second tier clean and leaves behind the verdict in its in its space okay so yeah so basically they just they just moved to another house and cleaned that up. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Just <laughs> Essentially. And yeah. and I would say the the one part that that could be argued that was modified from the verdict was the actual monetary value that came out of the verdict. Like how much the jury said that one side was supposed to pay to the other side. They modified that number through that settlement. But aside from that, what the jury determined was true and what was false remains. Okay. Like that's right. that still stays. It stands on its own. Okay. Can they request for? I guess I'm. Not, I, okay. I'll just I'll just say it. Vacater. Can they? Can they have the verdict vacated 
upon both of their requests. Ah, so from the so that's one of the that's one of the the benefits of them settling. Actually, is the fact that they they now have eliminated the threat that the other side will continue on with the legal process. So because they both have agreed to withdraw their their appeals. Um, and so with also with with that is a promise that they will not. I mean, I haven't seen the settlement agreement, obviously, but yeah, generally yeah. speaking, like this is what I would expect it to say is that is that, you know, they have agreed that they are they are removing it and that they will not ever refile it. So in order for for those questions to come up to potentially change the verdict, they would have to refile through through the same appellate court and oh. then continue on. They can't just like jump up to another like this. This completely cuts off that whole timeline that was being projected of like, OK, well, like if one side wins at the appellate level, then they can appeal to the Supreme Court right, and yeah. blah, 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 you know, all the way up until the, the United States Supreme Court. This cuts off that entire timeline because because now, you know, both sides have agreed we're not moving forward with any further litigation. Wow. Uh, <laughs> law is hard. <laughs> law, is hard. <laughs> law is hard. I mean, I, I must say that. The one the one place that I, I, I really disagreed with was allowing in that testimony of Adam Waldman, where the questions were asked of him in the deposition and every single, every single answer that he had was, I am going to listen to, to the counsel of my, my legal counsel and I am, or the instruction of my legal counsel and I'm not going to respond. Um, you know, yeah. I understand what that means as a lawyer, meaning that, that that is just, it's a, it's a vacancy. It's a whole, there's no evidence that comes out in that answer, but I, I, I do think that that was the reason why the jury ultimately uh, came came down in favor of Amber Heard for that one statement um, is because they were like, well, we have statements here by by Adam Waldman and he's deposed. And, you know, like they may have taken some some inferences from that, which are impermissible, because when it comes to the attorney client privilege, that was the that. reason why he yeah. couldn't give those answers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's pretty steadfast. Um, and and so you're the jury is not supposed to be making any any negative inferences by somebody saying, I'm not going to answer that question because of the attorney client privilege. Um, that's that's a that's a, a pretty big, big mistake, I think. Um, and I and I think that the likelihood of them like there was there was after watching that that, that whole deposition as it was played out in court. There was zero evidentiary value that came out of that deposition, like n none, like not even like like an argue, like some pieces that are arguably here or there. Every single answer was was a vacancy, you know, yeah. by his answer. Okay. Um, yeah. So in my opinion, I think that it was only damaging and for improper reasons to Johnny Depp to play that whole Adam Waldman deposition okay. in court. So, so you think it was more prejudicial? prejudicial to do so uh, uh, yeah I, I mean okay so to try and all right so what you're basically saying that like when he was answering the attorney client privilege if they were gonna if they were gonna play the deposition that that should have been cut out if i'm is yeah. that what you're trying to get at yeah oh, yeah okay. essentially okay. essentially oh. and and that was I mean, basically every answer other than like, maybe like, are you Adam Waldman <laughs> yeah, <laughs> was like, was I mean, basically that. No, no, there was an, uh, I, I, personally, I think the answer, I, I, um, I did, from what I saw from the Waldman deposition, there was an answer that he gave that both of them were actually at the Daily Mail. You know, they were actually there, both of them. So that mm. inference there, I can see why a juror would, would be like, okay, for statement three, I can see why you're liable. Final question. Actually, no, final two part question, I should say. <laughs> In this case, for civil cases, I know criminal cases, you can choose to plead the fifth and not testify at all as a, as a uh, mm -hmm. party. But in this case, in a civil case, was that option available to either of the, um, of the party? No, because neither side. So, and even in a civil case, someone can invoke their Fifth Amendment right if there is a threat that there that there could be a uh, criminal prosecution on the heels of the civil litigation. Um, so, you know, there are ways of of waiving that and whatnot. But, but um, 
in this particular case, there was no, like everything that had actually happened that was referenced by the, the Washington Post op-ed was like outside of any sort of criminal statute of limitations. So no one, no one was really in any sort of a, a position where arguably where they, they, they would have been under the threat of criminal prosecution. Okay, let me ask you like this, because the reason why I, I asked it like that was because I know the Fifth Amendment stops you from going to testify. Uh -huh. Let me ask you like yeah. this. Was the option, forget the Fifth Amendment, was yeah. the option for Amber Heard to not take the stand, was that available for her? Or Johnny Depp, for example? Well, not really. Okay. I mean, even just kind of... A, <laughs> Like if if we at least look at it from a strategic position, she also is was technically a plaintiff in the case, and a jury is always going to have questions about one of the parties not testifying. You know, oh, regardless okay. of whether that's proper or not, but especially in a civil case where where you have brought your own claims, if you then don't testify to actually back up those claims, a jury is usually going to look at that and say like do you really believe in yourself like if oh, okay. you're bringing this case okay so the option was there but it just wouldn't have been advisable i i well but even even still i don't know i mean so yeah she she could have technically decided for her own case i am not going to testify yeah uh, but at the same time she also could have been called as an adverse witness by johnny depp's side Oh, <laughs> so it was so. Ex All right, you said something really interesting there that I have personally never heard of, and I'm pretty sure that people that are watching this never heard of it as well. What is an adverse witness? It is when you call someone whose interests are not aligned with your party that you are representing. Oh, okay. So you can you can call someone who who you know that the other side just isn't gonna want to testify, but that you want them to testify for for whatever reason. Um, and you can you can call them and and the nature of that testimony or or the questioning really of for that testimony is going to be a little bit different because it's going to feel a little bit more like a cross examination on direct so like it's it's a whole different vibe for like what can happen there um but there there are some cases where where uh, an attorney will call an adverse witness and it is it is a different level of fun for the attorney sometimes <laughs> <laughs> i don't understand so I, I guess i will i will end on this um i, I guess i'll end on uh, and just ask do you think amber Heard should have testified do you think <laughs> how much of this case actually hinge on that testimony I think, I think at least for the panel um, and I think for a lot of people, too, that were watching, I think that everyone was kind of holding out to see what her testimony was, to see, like, what is the other side to the story? Because everyone kind of had this awareness of, like, yes, like, we're getting very convinced by Johnny Depp's side. Like, mm. everything, like, we're we're picking up what they're putting down. Like, we're, we're understanding, you know, where their position is with this. And everything seems to sort of fit. But what if there is this blind spot that is Amber Heard's side? You know, like, so what does she have to say about these experiences? And so everyone really was, I think, kind of waiting to see, like, is is her testimony going to confirm what we're thinking things look like right now? Or is this going to call into question everything that we just saw and just completely flip it? Um, so I think that I think that her testimony was very important. But I think at the same time, like looking back on it from from this vantage point, I really do think that she was damned if she did, damned if she didn't. With ultimately the, the performance that she gave, and, yeah. and I really use that word very choosingly because <laughs> I do think that she performed. You know, I I think that like you know, but you also have to. But every witness has to perform though. Like they like you, there there is no other word to actually use. Like it is every yes. Yeah. Every every witness, every witness is is hyper aware of their their surroundings. Of of course. You know, like yeah. they're they're aware that they are being questioned by an attorney, they're gonna get cross examined by another attorney, they've got a bunch of strangers over there that are all watching them and analyzing them and, and maybe even judging them. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and like, you know, picking apart everything that they're saying and how yeah. they're saying it. So, so like, yeah, every single witness feels some level of pressure, at least in on that, that witness stand. Um, but, but I, I did really feel like she was 
performing a part very uniquely more so than than the other witnesses yeah. uh, that were testifying. Um, that was just that was the way that she subjectively came across to me. Um, so I I I think that if she had if she had played things differently, then things could have ended up very differently. Um, but I think she had a very specific role that she wanted to play and she thought that that would be successful. Um, but I, I don't, I don't, I mean, obviously it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Aliyah. Thank you so much for joining me. I You're really welcome. love this conversation. It has been you're a funny woman. I'll give you that. <laughs> Thank you. I, I appreciate it. <laughs> did not expect like there's so many like no, I mean there's, there were so many one-liners I didn't see coming. But yeah, th <laughs> um, thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me. Um, and um, you know, uh, like tell us about your uh, about your about your YouTube channel. Like, how can people find you? Like, what do you do on there? Yeah, so I so Legal Bites or, or or Legal Bites Media is how you can find me. Um, I, I just uh, you can just look it up on on YouTube, <laughs> um, or or the handle that's below. Um, <laughs> we cover we cover all kinds of of legal topics that are in the news or in pop culture or I mean typically something that is that is you know what people are currently talking about or 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 uh, or following um, and just picking it apart so that i can help people make sense of the law one bite at a time that's oh. basically that's the way love the it. way the way i like to think of it <laughs> love it thank you so much for joining me i appreciate it so much of course <laughs> thank you for having me <laughs>